this computer. I did copy into the chat a link to the kind of notes document that I'm using for structuring the conversation today. Um, I um, want to talk a little bit about how the Respondus tools uh, lockdown browser and monitor work with the LMS. I've kind of already alluded to that. Since uh, since everyone is not as, as expert with quizzes as Liz is, I do want to talk a little bit about uh, setting up a Moodle quiz um, and then talk about set, uh, applying the tools on top of, on top of that. So um, just one disclaimer, um, the lockdown browser, if you decide to use that, on top of the Moodle quiz for security, it does lock out the kind of screen readers that some of our students do currently use. Mm. We are uh, oh, the uh, um, the Office of Disability ODR. ODR is working on uh, making arrangements for us to add another tool on top of Respondus. Um, well, just another tool in Moodle that will work with Respondus to allow the, the screen reading kind of functionality. Uh, text to speech works, but that's kind of uh, inconvenient for students because it would read the whole screen, including all of the HTML code and so forth. So, um, I mean, Moodle has a fairly robust quiz activity that can be used for either low stakes or high stakes online testing. Multiple choice, uh, short answer, uh, various kinds of question types that we'll go over. Um, the way that the Respondus tools, and there are two of them, Lockdown Browser and Monitor, work is they, they wrap a secure environment around whatever the assessment tool is in your LMS. For our Moodle system, it would be the quiz activity. So I want to take a little bit, maybe a third of our time, to go over how uh, you would set up a, a quiz in Moodle for those of you who have no experience doing that, and some tricks and tips that I would I would suggest. Uh, we'll spend about a third of the time looking at um, the browser, the lockdown browser, and and monitor tools for Respondus, and then you know have have some time for uh, additional questions. So let me let me go ahead and start sharing my screen. And uh, just for those of you who are completely new to uh, doing quizzes in, activ uh, in Moodle, I do have a link here in this document that I've shared around to the quick quiz quick guide documentation at Moodle.org. It'll give you uh, kind of, of um, how, to, how to set things up. I, I would actually do things a little bit differently than is on the quick start here, and I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, but uh, it gives you a good place to start. And then it also has links to, um, you know, the, oops, that's not what I wanted. Um, to the main landing page for the quiz activity. We're, we're talk about the different kinds of question types that are built into Moodle. We've actually added some additional question types beyond what is built in. Uh, there are uh, pages at Moodle.org that talk about the different settings for the quiz and the um, steps for building a quiz and so forth. So, you know, do uh, take advantage of that documentation from uh, Moodle.org. My basic workflow when I set up a quiz is to create the question bank first and then add the quiz activity, which is pretty much just a container for the eventual container for the questions. 
when you set up the quiz activity, you'll determine how that, that quiz activity behaves, how many times the students can take it, um, you know, uh, how you're going to handle multiple attempts, uh, all, all, these other, uh, all these other things. Then, then once you have the quiz activity set up and you've got your questions in the question bank, then you can add questions to your quiz and your quiz will be ready to go whenever you have set it to open up. The reason I do this, besides just being an anal compulsive kind of person, is that I really do like to spend some time organizing the, the questions in the question bank for my course. And I'll show you what that means in a minute. You could, you could add a quiz activity and then just start writing questions in the quiz activity, um, but A, that's a lot of work and it's slow because you've got to write the questions one by one. I spend most of my time importing pre-existing questions or questions that I've written in Word. Okay, so given that, let me, um, and Marie, I've, I've kind of collapsed all of the gallery windows on my end here, so, and I'm not paying attention to the chat, so, so, um, break in if there's something I need to address. Uh, let me go to my sandbox here. The first step that I would do in, in setting this all up is, maybe if I make this a little bigger. Yeah, under the administration block for your course, there are, um, there's a section for question banks where you could go to write individual questions if you wanted to, a place where you could set up categories, a place for importing questions, and a place for export, exporting questions. I generally will be very uh, organized in the kinds of categories that I set up because um, that allows me to do a variety of things. For example, uh, actually, if I go back, let me just go to my last semester course. And if we look at uh, categories for that course, okay. you can see I basically have set up a category for every topic that I'm covering in the course. It could be chapters in the text or how are you organizing your course? And then I make sure that I am importing or writing the questions for that category and organizing them in that category. Why, I, why do I do that? I do it primarily because um, I use quizzes mostly for low stakes, reading readiness, formative assessment kind of purposes. So they will have gone, my students will have gone through the material on sedimentary processes and rocks. Before we're in class to talk about it, uh, I want them to all do a low stakes quiz on the material in um, a little beforehand. And you can see I've got 39 questions in this category. I would typically set up the quiz so that the quiz will randomly pick 10 question from this category every time a student comes to it and I will give the students like five or ten tries basically. Um, I don't care the more time they're they're taking these quizzes the more time they're spending on tasks. This is not probably what you're thinking about for a high stakes exam at the end of the, of the class but uh, you know just for going forward these kinds of quiz activities are, are useful to make sure your students are engaging with the materials and you can get a report as to what questions they got right what questions they got wrong ahead of class so you can figure out how to how to schedule the class for the exam rather than writing an exam that has 50 specific questions on it you could think about having an exam that picks you know two questions from this category and two questions from this category and four questions in this category so that different students aren't getting the same exact exam. Uh, if you're going to do that for a high stakes exam kind of purpose, you really want to make sure that you're, the variance that you're asking on the questions 
are really pretty comparable so that even though students are getting different flavors of the question, uh, they are, and, and therefore they're not getting exactly the same uh, exams from one per, from one student to the next, they're at least getting comparable exams. But anyway, I, I think it's useful to, to organize things into categories like this. If you're just doing, I, I got, I've got one exam I'm going to write for a, a final exam for the course, you don't have to worry about this as much. Uh, so, how to get your questions in. Um, you can write your questions from scratch in Moodle. That gives you more control. It gives you more different kinds of feedback that you can provide to the students, and it is more work and more time. Uh, as I've mentioned, I spend much more of my time importing questions, uh, especially since for my um, kind of reading response readiness kinds of questions, I'm mostly providing a random set of 10 multiple choice questions over the reading and doing that, a lot of students do that multiple times. So I've had to reteach myself how to learn, how to, how to write good multiple choice questions because I didn't write multiple choice questions for decades. But if you do have multiple choice questions on your exam, your, your quiz, whatever, you're, whatever level you're calling it, those are easily imported. So let me just, uh, um, let me just go back to the sandbox so I'm not um, messing up one of my official courses. Again, if you go to the administration block, question bank, uh, if you go to import, these are the different kinds of file formats that you can import directly into Moodle. Um, the one, if you are writing multiple choice questions, the format that you would probably want to use is this Aiken format. And you can see there's a little question mark next to it. If you click on that, you'll get a little pop-up that says, this is a simple format for importing multiple choice questions from a text file. If I click on more help, you'll get the Moodle document page that talks about the Aiken format. And, um, let me just, you can, you can read through what it says here, but if you just look at the examples, can everyone kind of tell how you would take your Word document that has your multiple choice test and convert it into a file format that Moodle can understand? Basically, you just have to give the answer. So if I come over here and I've got, let's say I had written these questions uh, in, in Word, I could just add a line for each of the questions. Now, the, the question has to be on a line, no line breaks. Each answer has to begin with you know, A, B, C, or D, either A period or A um, parentheses. Um, and the answers all have to be on one line, meaning that there's no line break, right? So e this, this is one line answer, even though it wraps around. There's, there's just the line break at the end there. And then I would just say, answer, let's see, radiometric gauge from metamorphic rock. Uh, answer for that one is D. Uh, Keith, can I ask a question? I'm sure. sorry. Um, so I just want to make sure I'm understanding you. You see, you see, you don't press return. You keep it all one line. Is that what you're saying? Or, or there is a question. What? No, you, you start out, write the question, right. and then hit return. Right. And then do A, period, and then write the first answer. So there, are a there are line breaks between the, the answer choices. There are line breaks between the answer choices. Right. And yeah. also, is it a um, bad idea to keep it in auto format where, you know, it turn, basically... Turn, that was a point I was going to make here. You should probably, you would want to turn off auto formatting. Okay. Because Word will, will convert straight quotes to curly quotes, and those will show up as question marks in your question in Moodle. Um, right. And is there a way, there's obviously a way to like do a trial run on your own to make, to see what the students see to make sure that. Yeah, we'll look at that in a minute. Okay. Yeah. 
answer for that one was A, and then the answer for this one is C. Okay, so I've written this in Word. If I go to File and do Save As, you want to save this as a plain text document. Not a rich text, not a Word doc, it has to be a plain text. And for those of you who are working on Macs, uh, let me just call this um, history.txt. If you're working uh, for, uh, in Word on a Mac, when you hit save, when you're doing a plain text file, you will get this option. You'll want to select the text encoding for MS-DOS, which is what Word on Windows should select for default. You don't want Mac OS text in encoding for this plain text file. Okay. And so now out of the desktop, I've got this text file. Don't that anymore. Don't need that anymore. If I select Aiken format, um, Choose, I've uh, got too many windows open. You know, you just drag and drop that text file on, click import. It's going to say, okay, I'm importing four questions from the file. And if I click continue, I will see these four questions. Now, of course, I should have picked the um, the category that I wanted these questions to go into doesn't matter. I could I can move them now if I wanted to. And now I've added four more questions to the questions that are in this uh, category. If you're looking at the list of questions in the category. Multiple choice questions show up with this little multiple choice um, symbol here. And well, that's all I've got. If I wanted to preview a question, I could click on the little preview button here. Um, and I would see um, a, uh, um, a preview of the individual question. And um, that one. okay. So that's a much easier way to get multiple choice questions in. I'll show you how you can actually add multiple choice questions one by one when we talk about writing questions in Moodle. But uh, just to give you a little more idea here, if we go to administration, question bank, import, there are other formats available. If you do more besides just multiple choice questions, but you still want to write them in Word, you could check out this GIFT format, um, but you're going to have to learn a little markup language. So if I t uh, go here, I won't um, go through all of the general instructions, but if we go come down here to some examples, you can see that um, you've got ways of giving questions a, um, uh, a title, uh, providing the question. Here is a multiple choice question. What's between orange and green in the spectrum? The uh, uh, orange and green. The uh, yellow is correct answer, red is wrong, uh, blue is wrong. You can give the right and wrong answers, you can provide feedback, you can specify. I don't encounter a lot of faculty who want to learn a, another markup language just so that they can write questions in Word with a markup language rather than in Moodle, but uh, there are uh, there are some of us uh, coders around who might like that. Okay, so that's that's importing questions. 
Let me just. What about just? I'm sorry, Keith. What about just short answer mode? Like, well, uh, there, there is this embedded answers format. Actually, short answers are pretty easy to write in Moodle. So if I were going to do a bunch of short answer questions, I probably would write them in Moodle. Okay, um, just write them. Write them. Yeah. And when you mean write, I can just copy paste from my. From well, my I'll, I'll show you what the process is next. Okay. About how how to create questions uh, from scratch in Moodle. So if I go again to Question Bank and go to Questions. I can um, maybe let's let's create a new category here. Maybe I'll call this final exam. So now I've got two categories in my question bank. I've got this one that I had there before for some quiz I did earlier in the semester, and now I've got this uh, category for the final exam. If I go to questions and uh, select that category, I can click create a new question. And here are all of the different kinds of questions that you can create. So there's short answer, there's true false. Again, if you are going to have multiple choice questions on your exam, I would import them from a Word document. But if I wanted to write a short answer question, I would click. Well, let, let, let me add a multiple choice question first, just to show you the difference. So if I wanted to add a multiple choice question, I click add. And the question name, I don't know, I'll, I'll call it sunrise. Here's the question that's actually the uh, text that's actually displayed to the student. What uh, direction? is the sunrise. And then uh, you can specify how many points by default. If you import questions with the GIF format, by default they're all tagged as a one point question. Um, you can have actually multiple, allow students to select multiple answers. I'm going to make this a, a traditional multiple choice question, leave the default. I will shuffle the choices. Uh, I'll have choice one be north. And I'm going to give that a grade of zero. Oh, oh wait a minute. 100%. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, oh, none. Okay, they get no points for that. Uh, I'm going to go south. You can see that writing the basic multiple choice question is probably a little bit faster in Word. East. And east, I definitely want to make that 100%. And the west. And. Um, the interesting thing about writing the multiple choice question is you've got a lot more choice chance for feedback here. And maybe, you know, maybe north and south aren't quite as incorrect as west. So maybe I will give a student, you know, a third of a point for saying north or south. I, I wouldn't, but I just want to show you. And uh, you know, provide some feedback about like uh, not quite uh, feedback on here. You could say uh, correct, um, and so forth. You can specify if you've got multiple correct answers. You can come up with a feedback for. You know, any answer that is 100% and the answer that's partially correct, any answer that's incorrect, you can specify. Uh, we'll talk about this later, but you could s allow students to uh, choose the answer that they think in the quiz and do uh, and submit it before they submit the whole quiz. If they get it wrong, they can try again and you can specify how much 
Is they're docked each time they get an incorrect try before they get the right answer. Lots of different ways you can use the quiz activity, but I'll just save those changes. Again, hopefully you, you can see, and it shows up as a multiple choice question. Um, I would not want to write 100 multiple choice questions that way. Right. Keith, um, can, so can you only shuffle um, the uh, answer choices if you do it the this way? Like if you oh. import via uh, the, the Word document, can you still have the option to shuffle the answer that's, choices? That's the default, actually. And okay. it's, also a, it's also a setting that you set on the quiz activity. If you want to do a short answer question, yes. you, um, I don't know, call it something, write a question, and you know maybe for the short answer question, you want to make it worth two points. And then here's what uh, Onda was talking about because she uses short answer questions where she's asking for you know, specific French grammar feedback or, or something. Is, you know, who's buried in Grant's tomb? Well, you could have Grant as a correct answer. You could have uh, U.S. Grant as a correct answer. You could have Ulysses S. Grant. As a correct answer. And maybe you only want to give half credit for U.S. Grant and so forth. So if you are going to if you're going to do short answer and you want Moodle to grade the short answers for you, then you're going to have to think ahead. What are all the um, what are all the short answers that I would give credit for and and give them to Moodle so that Moodle can do that grading for you? There's a way to manage. Yeah, man, it seems like manual is almost the best bet on this. There is a way to do manual grading, and and we'll look at that as well. But if I click Save Changes then I've got a short answer question. If I wanted to uh, create, do a multiple choice question, I mean a true false question. Um, you know, writing, writing multiple choice questions in Moodle is easy. And uh, I'm going to have false be the correct answer. Click save, and I would have a, um, a true false question. I won't take a lot of time. I mean, you can go through and look at all of these built in core Moodle type questions. So if you're setting up essay questions, uh, I mean, if you had a if you had a final exam that were that was six essay questions that you could set up very easily. Um, you know, um, you know, describe the history of water on Mars. At a 20 point question. Click save changes, and I've got the essay question that I can use on my exam. But do take a look at some of these question types. Uh, you can um, have uh, quantitative questions where you set up in the question you know, specific um, base conditions and Moodle will give a uh, a, a um, you know uh, a, a question to the students where they have to calculate based on the parameters that they're given and and, and submit the right answer so there's lots of different things I don't think we have anyone from music on the call but we've added a, you know, a music theory uh, set of questions you can drag and drop onto images. So if you've got, if you want students to um, label the different parts of the Krebs cycle, you could have an unlabeled uh, image of the Krebs cycle and have little, um, you know, um, word uh, 
stickers that they need to drag and drop on to the correct hot spots on the image. Lots of different uh, image uh, uh, question types. And there are I others have we a can question. Ask Sorry. So I have a question. If you have an, uh, an essay, uh, does it also uh, look for copy paste? No. Oh, so if, they write. if you're doing a fully essay final exam, I you might want to do that as a turn it in assignment. Okay, no, I, I thought would using it for a, a kind of short answer, not really essay, because I didn't see any other really options. So that was one thing. Yeah. Other thing, I had a quiz and I had the drag uh, markers. And a couple students, uh, they said, uh, claimed or said, whatever you say, we'll want to say it, right. uh, that they put it there, but it didn't stick. Okay. But I tested my questions first and I had no problem. So I don't know. Yeah. Um, boy, it's hard to troubleshoot that. I mean, maybe they weren't hitting what you had set up as, as the hotspot for that image. Or, um, I mean, with, with something, certainly we can, we can check, but you know, you previewed the question and it seemed to work for you, right? Anyway. So, um, importing questions, writing questions. If we go to... Uh, Actually, Keith, I have a question I, I, that might be related to the previous yeah. topic. Go ahead. Um, is there any, and I, I think I might know the answer to this already, but I just want to verify. There is no like drawing option, right? Students can't like use their There, are, there, are, there are question types that would involve that, I think, if we go to the Moodle site. Um, I mean, if that's something you want in a few weeks so that we've got some time to check it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I like simple drawings, you know, that, you know, that will convey certain concepts. So I didn't just want to know if that option existed. Since you all are on the call here and uh, you need to have some perk for taking time out other than just listening to me, you go to Moodle.org and click on downloads mm -hmm. and go to the extend Moodle part where it says plugins directory. Um, we want uh, to look at all of the question types and do a search. And there's word select, there's code runner, there's audio, record audio question type. Some of these would take more work for us to install on our systems than others. But if you find one that looks like it would allow students to do it, the kind of simple drawing that you want them to be able to do, let us know. And these will be imported directly into the quiz thing, the way the plugin yeah. works? Or so any of these question add-ons, if we um, vet that we're okay putting them on uh, Moodle production, we would add them to Moodle and then they would just show up. Okay. As, you know, if you go to questions an and, and questions and go to uh, create a new question, they would show up there. Okay. Is there a way, if you're able to do that, I'm interested in that question type as well. Can you follow up with us to let us know that it's now available? Uh, well, we'd have to, I mean, uh, Elliot, I would, or, or, I mean, if you look over these question and types. Find like, one and then, then suggest find it. Find one that you would like us to add to Moodle, suggest it to me. Okay. So then quickly, uh, we that's getting your questions together. Then the quiz activity is essentially the container for that. And uh, I won't go through all of these in detail. Just let me expand all of the settings here. Uh, you, can, you definitely will want to determine when the quiz opens and when the quiz closes. So you enable those and, and specify the time. Um, you have to decide, are you gonna give students, you know, 
you're going to give the students 60 minutes for the quiz, but you're going to give them any time between um, May 4th at some time in the morning to uh, May 5th. So you, know, you give them maybe a one day or a two day time period, or if you want, give them the specific uh, three hour block that you have uh, on the final exam schedule. You might want to be a little bit more flexible given the situations that everyone is dealing with. So, you know, give them the, uh, we actually get two hours and 30 minutes, so that's 150 minutes. Give them the 150 minutes, but maybe, um, you know, give them um, any time during that day to uh, to pick some 150 time minute time period within that time to do it. So this has to be asynchronous then? No, I mean, you could, you, you could do it such that, you know, you've got... But what you just described is asynchronous. What I just described is asynchronous. If, if that is uncomfortable for you, then you go ahead and do whatever the you know, actual time periods are. It'd be more like, let's say 12 to 2.30, uh, whatever the final exam date is. And you just have to tell them, okay, you're all gonna have to be in here at this time to do it. Uh, you might, I, I usually uh, switch this to um, automatically submitting open attempts. If they come up to the end of the time period and they don't actually hit submit before the time elapses, I don't want the whole exam to evaporate. So, you know, if they come to some time limit, I want Moodle to say, okay, time's up, we're submitting what you've got. So um, what you're saying is that if you don't submit that and they go over time, the whole thing will just possibly. shut down? I, I don't take the chance. I, I would have to look into that in more detail. Okay. I mean, there's a little question mark here. Uh, if the student's actually working on a quiz at the time, the countdown timer will automatically uh, attempt to them, but if they've logged out, this controls what happens. Okay? So, uh, if you're doing a single high stakes uh, exam, you want to obviously make that one attempt, not unlimited. Um, if you are only doing uh, one um, attempt at the, at the quiz, you don't need to worry about any of this. But for the future reference, if you are doing multiple attempts, you know, give students five tries on the quiz because you just want them to work on the material. Probably don't want to show them the right answer until the quiz is closed. Um, there are other kinds of extra restrictions and so forth you can put on here, but I mean, um, the main behaviors are when is it opening, when is it closing, what's the time limit, how many attempts. Uh, if you're doing more than one attempt, uh, you know, what's the grading method? Are you providing feedback before the quiz is closed or not? And then um, you click save to create the quiz activity. That essentially uh, creates the container. And if I go into it, it Moodle will tell me, eh, no questions been in, in, added yet. Uh, so either here or later on, if you go into administration and click edit, quiz, you'll get to the screen where you can actually add the questions to the um, to the quiz. And so uh, I'm just going to take the easy way out. I'm going to click add a random question. I am going to uh, do 15 or 20 random questions from this category click add a random question, and you'll see every time a student comes, they're gonna get 20 different questions from that question. Now, if you're writing a final exam and you want every student to see the same questions, 
you obviously would instead go add a question from a question bank and you would select you know one of the questions that you want on the final sure and click add select questions and they would be added uh, to and you would see you would see a listing of the specific questions. Um, let me just quickly go back to quit settings on the quiz. One thing that um, I usually take the time to change is under this layout. The default is for every question to be on a separate page, which I think is annoying, especially if they're just multiple choice questions. You can have all the questions on one web page displayed to the students. You can have, you know, every 10 questions, they get a, um, another page, whatever makes sense for yours. The, if you got multiple choice questions, the default question behavior is to shuffle the answers within the questions, um, which is probably what you want, especially for this situation. And now if I click, um, save and return to course. Here you've got the quiz and then um, if you want to see what it looks like from the student's perspective, you don't have to switch your, your role to student or anything. You can keep your regular role. You're in the quiz. The, this is what the, stu the quiz tells students. You got one attempt. It's, this is when it's available. This is when it closes. This is the time period, it's currently not available. If you uh, click on preview, you will see that um, this is what students will see when they click on the activity. This is a time quiz, uh, gives them the information, they would click start attempt, and they would see 10 questions per page because of um, the way I set it up. And um, as they, you know, randomly check some of these, and uh, I'm not sure what's going on with that question, so I would change that. As um, as I answer, or as your students answer, and they go to the next page, they will see. Okay, now I'm, now I'm working on this set of questions and I've already looked at these set of questions. I've, submit, I've, I've penciled in answers for these, but maybe I better go back and answer, uh, you know, answer some of these other questions. I have a question. Um, yep. I'm very interested in embedding images or using images as the questions themselves. Would you be, and I noticed that you have images in some of yours. Can we take a look at one of those examples and sure. the edit a question function on the left, just so I can get a sense of how that's structured? So uh, students would eventually click finish and their uh, test would be uh, submitted. If you wanted to start a new preview, you could do that. Since you're the instructor, you can see what you know, a, a second preview of it would look like. Um, actually, I can go in right here because you're looking at this as the instructor, if I click edit question, it'll take me into the editor that we looked at for writing a multiple choice question. So when you are in the area where you're doing the question text, you have the full range of Moodle editing features available to you. You could even uh, link to a YouTube website, for a web page, for example, and that, uh, as long as that video was embeddable, that video would show up in the question. So yeah, if you want to use uh, um, images, you would just you know do the insert or edit image tool, you know, drag and drop or or find your uh, image and insert it, and then the image would be there in the question. And if you look at the um, responses, the answers. You could do the same thing there. You could actually have images in the answer. Okay. So can we? You go um, ahead. 
can we also do the same for you you mentioned youtube can we do the same for audio or post an audio there yeah yes um there are a couple of different options let's talk offline about that i'll go oh sure sure okay yeah send, send me shoot me an email oh sure i will thank you so Keith, you were showing URLs. Can you just simply drag, say, an image that's on your desktop and plop it in there, or is that more possible? I mean, it's worth trying, Elliot. Okay. I mean, the the Moodle text editor. I don't, editor I don't think so. Functional. You have to save everything as a picture file and put everything in, so it's pretty painful. It takes a long time. I do that all the time with chemistry. Right, so you have to save it as a picture file, and then what? Then you import it somehow? Then you import it the way Keith just showed you. Through a URL or? No, okay. let's, let, let's say I had an image on the screen, on, on my desktop, which, oh, I, your desktop. which I do right now. Uh -huh. uh, find, upload an image, choose the file, I go to my desktop, here's a screenshot. Okay. Upload the file, insert, and it's there. Okay, so you didn't really have to change the format or anything. You can yeah. just plop it in. I mean, insert. Uh, you don't have to change it to a pic or anything like that. It, no. it can be it, it, JPEG, PNG, GIF, you know, anything. Any, any kind of file format, image file format. Okay, so. I'm going to ask, uh, hi, this is Michael Hammett from the Testing Center. Can I ask a quick question about uh, about time on the tests? Sure. Um, so if a professor decides to stick with the, say, the original testing uh, time, students with accommodations would get often extended time based on right. their accommodations. Can you edit the time for specific students to give them their yeah, experience? Yes, and, and ODR has these directions, but let me just repeat it here. So. Here I am, um, I'm in the quiz. If I go to the administration option for that quiz, there are user overrides. And I could add a user override. I would uh, pick the, the student. So sample student two gets, um, you know, time and a half. Let's say just double time, it'll be easier. 300 minutes and instead of going so that is uh, six hours so instead of going till 430 it goes till six and I click save and now there is an override for that student on this quiz. Can I just add something because I just did it and then I changed in the main menu for the quiz I changed the end time and obviously it changed it to all students they had extend, extended time so i should have gone back and changed that as well right yeah so i didn't know that um not quite picturing what you did but yeah i mean you would you would have the default time periods for everyone in the class except for those students who have overrides yeah i did that but then i went back and i extended the time for everybody and then this time was automatically set as the end time for the students with right. the end of time. But I did not know that because I set a time for them. You know, once, you set an override, once you set an override for a student, that student is divorced from the settings on the, or from those settings on the general quiz. So yeah, if you had adjusted the end time for everyone, you'd have to go into the overrides and pop again, pop yes, and then you have to go back again. I did not know that. So uh, just quickly to talk about how to wrap lockdown browser and um, monitor around this. If you go, if you got editing turned on in your course, you can add the Oh, you can add the Respondus Lockdown Browser, which I've already added, which is why it's not showing up in the list here. So you would, you would go to add a block, and in the list of blocks would be listed Respondus Lockdown Browser. This block does just one simple thing. It gives you access to your Respondus dashboard for this course. Like, click on it, 
it is going to load the dashboard. And um, let me just say a few things about here before you continue on to, before we continue on to a lockdown browser. If you're using this for the first time, take advantage of these tutorials. Uh, so there's just kind of a general overview here. If you click on the tutorials link, you've got a whole set of tutorials. And because this is coming from what we've installed on our Moodle system, these are all specific to Moodle, our Moodle installation. So here you could go to the respondents website and, and see a generalized introduction to lockdown browser. Here you see it um, discussed specifically in the context of using it within Moodle, uh, preparing a quiz for use in Moodle. Here's what it would look like for a student to use lockdown browser from our Moodle system um, and so forth. There are all sorts of, uh, you know, getting started recommendations and resources that you can make use of. Um, but you will eventually want to continue on to Lockdown Browser. And what you will see listed here. Uh, Keith, before you go into this, can I just ask a general question? Yeah. Because, and I don't want to delay things. But you know, I've been talking to people about this, and people are concerned on on how this might be an invasion of property. Is is what's your res quick response to that? You mean the intellectual property for the faculty member creating the exam, or the no, no, no. I mean like the student. We're actually infiltrating their their browser and locking it down. You are not touching their browser. They have to lock. They have to download a stripped down Chrome Chrome Chromium based version of a web browser that is automatically launched from Moodle. You're not so can they open up independent browsers? They like know. When they start the quiz, it, it will either prompt them to download this separate browser, which is available for Mac, Windows, or iPad. No Chromebooks, you know, um, no iPhones, no Android devices. Okay. Uh, but it does not touch their browser. And they, so we can imagine oh. we're going to get some pushback um, on, you know, people who are taking the, their quizzes on these particular devices. What do we say to that? Well, we, the, the usage of our Moodle site is one third iOS devices, one third Mac OS devices, one third Windows devices. Okay. Um, the issue with the one-third iOS devices is probably a large proportion of that is iPhone, not iPad. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is why if you're going to use these tools, you should wrap these tools around a non-graded test quiz a week or so in, in advance of the final exam. For trial, yeah. Make sure all of your students are able to do it. Good, yeah, that's a good idea. But can they have an, can they have another browser browser open at the same time so they could go back and forth? They can, but they won't be able to get access to it. Okay. Lockdown browser gives them no controls over anything other than okay. completing the quiz. But obviously, they can have their iPhone open and they this have like their the iPhone open, which is why you might want to consider adding Respondus Monitor, which basically allow makes them have a webcam on so that um, there is a recording of their actual uh, activities during the exam. So Excellent. Really, yeah. my, yeah. Son pointed, my son pointed out that they can have an, a phone right on their screen and do something there and the camera wouldn't see that. Well, I'm just too old to get those ideas, but. <laughs> 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 There, there is no perfect security, even in a face-to-face -face exam setting, right? So there are things we can do. One is, do you even want to have a high stakes online exam? Maybe there are authentic assessment activities that replace that. Or if you do, if you do typically do a, a final exam, do you want to uh, convert it over to a quiz activity in Moodle? Uh, we've had faculty do final exams online in Moodle without any kind of uh, browser security in the past by 
you know, doing multiple versions and doing timed uh, time testing and writing questions where they can't just look up the answer on the internet. You know, if you have, you know, thoughtful, if you're more interested in the kinds of analytic, their, their ability to analyze information, you could probably do an online exam without any of these security measures and not worry about uh, or just we have faculty who say, okay, well, I'm just going to treat this as if it were any other open book exam and, 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 you know, design it appropriately. All right. Be that as it may, if you want to wrap these tools around a quiz activity in Moodle, uh, you would go into your dashboard here. You would see all of the quiz activities that you have in your course. And uh, this example quiz that I just created, is currently tagged as not requiring either lockdown browser or respondents monitor. So if I pull down this uh, pull down menu here, I can go to settings and I can require a respondents monitor for this exam. Now, uh, Liz, you were asking about uh, allowing students to get access to online reference sheet. If you un go under advanced settings, uh, you can allow access to specific external web domains. You would put those domains in here. You would then have the link on the quiz somewhere, not in the description to the quiz, but in the quiz itself. And once the students start the quiz and go into Lockdown Browser, they would see that link, they would click on it, that link would be validated by you having said it's okay to go here, and Lockdown Browser would, would allow them to pull up that screen. So they'll only be able to get that link if you both put the link inside the quiz and list right. the domain for it here. That's my understanding. And where would you put it in the quiz? Um, like in question one, or question one. go to such and such site, here's the link, and add the link as, you know, using the editing tools in Moodle. Okay. You can't just put the domain here because they have no ability to, A, open a, a second tab in Lockdown Browser, and B, there's no, um, there's no uh, field for typing in a web address. Right. So they wouldn't be able to, and they can't write, they can't uh, select the text and copy it and then paste it in. Right. So wait, when they, when they click on it in the quiz, does it open as a separate tab? or how I does think it, it may open as a separate tab, but we, I haven't tested that. I, I tried it, and when I did it, it opened instead of the quiz, and then you couldn't go back. So it did let them go to it, but then they, they were done. <laughs> no, I mean, that's where we, we need to look into that more because okay. you know, clearly they, it, Lockdown Browser is set up to, for students to be able to access from within the quiz um, specific external resources. Okay. So I'll take a look and see. I'll do some testing on that. If you need them to have a calculator and you don't want them to use a calculator, you can give them an on-screen calculator uh, and so forth. Um, once you I have, have a, I have a question, Keith, before you yeah. proceed, because um, it's along the same lines as, as what Liz was talking about. And I, I'm not sure how complicated her, like her external information is, but like on my exams, I give a list of uh, protein factors and genes that they can use. Um, so do I have to set up like a website for that, that, that can link, like how, do, how do I administer that particular? But, but, you know, I, I pulled up their web page on doing this feature 10 minutes before the workshop here. So let me ship out that URL to you and, and Liz. So, I mean, okay. I tried doing it as I made a page on Moodle that had the information that I would usually print out for them and yeah. then linked to that page. Um, so oh, I Moodle, to the Moodle page. Okay. Right. All right. You know, there are, no, the, there are non-question questions in the Moodle question bank. 
So you could theoretically put that reference information into a question that they're not actually submitting. Then it would be right within the quiz itself and there would be less of this, I need to be able to get out to an external site. Kind but of they can reference it throughout. Oh, that's so much better. <laughs> that's my problem because you know, it's a list of factors that they could potentially need for any question. Mm -hmm. So it's not just for one question or two questions. Right. I'm not saying put it into the question itself, but there is a way that you can put extended text material. Text That's going to always be present on the screen. It would all. It would be. It would always be present in the. I mean, if you've got your quiz set up so that the quiz is one, all on one page, it yeah. would always be present on the screen. Oh, I see. Because they just scroll up and down. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think lockdown browser is. Can you add me to that too? If you if you figure sure. out how that works, let me know. Thank you. Um, what what do you want to tell Liz and and Elliot? Yeah, got thank it. you. So uh, lockdown browser basically, and we'll see what this looks like from the student perspective in a minute. Um, means that when they go to take the quiz, they would launch it by clicking on a button that says open this up in lockdown browser essentially and uh, Moodle would automatically launch lockdown browser which is uh, we actually have a tighter integration with lockdown browser than say blackboard which doesn't do the automatic launching that's pretty straightforward uh, you can also decide whether or not you want to uh, use the monitor pro uh, product if you require uh, mon monitor, it basically they, they need to be taking the test on a setup that has some sort of a webcam, their, their MacBook, their, uh, you know, their, their Windows desktop with a webcam, their iPad that's got a built-in camera so that um, you can go through a variety of, of things. So, um, this is an add-on feature, um, blah, blah, blah. So if we continue to there. Um, uh, Keith, is it true that students can go to, um, to the, uh, uh, the, I'm drawing a blank on the place, the IT place um, to get a webcam or get a, a loaner computer if they don't have it? Is that possible? I don't, I don't know. Right, okay. That's a CTS question. Yeah, yeah, CTS is what I meant. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so Monitor basically has them go through a startup sequence before they take the exam. And you can determine what that startup sequence is, and give them additional instructions. You can decide whether or not to provide the built in guidelines and tips for taking a monitored exam. You can require them to hold up their, you, you, you can require them to sit in front of their webcam and click take a picture, which is what this is. You can require them or not to show up their photo, to show their photo ID to the webcam and click take a picture. Uh, you, uh, you can require or not to have them take the webcam and kind of scan around the room so that you have an idea of the environment that they're taking in. That one I find kind of intrusive. Um, Plus, what if you can't remove your webcam? What if it's embedded in your, in your I guess well, you move your laptop around? If it's embedded in your laptop, you move your laptop around. If it's in your iPad, you move your iPad around. If it's a webcam that's you know, USB connected to your desktop, you can you know, move that around. But I, I don't really want to see students' rooms. Right. I told them to do it so that I can see their desk space because they're going to be using scrap paper and calculators. Okay. So I said, just you so know, show me the workspace that you're using. Yeah. And um, you, did you edit the text here then, Liz? Yeah. 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 Uh, you can also have facial detection options so that um, you know if the student's face isn't visible in the webcam, they can't even start up the uh, exam during the startup sequence. Um, the monitor product will essentially do a continuous video recording from that webcam as they're going through the 150 minutes of taking the exam. 
and uh, what if they were to get up and leave the room like does that just know the exam like what is it they do? Were get, if they got up and left the room that would be flagged and you would know to know about it and you would have to have a conversation with a student it does not necessarily invalidate the exam right if if someone comes and sits down next to them that would be flagged there's a the, you know the, you, there are obviously thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of hours of video that's involved in all of the monitor based proctored sessions um, and no one is sitting down and looking at every second of those videos right. they have uh, various ai uh, analyses of the videos and they will flag uh you know suspicious behavior and you know just like trinidad does not tell you whether paper's been plagiarized or not it gives you right. information and then you have to make a decision and you have to have a conversation with a student same thing here monitor does not tell you if the student is cheating or not it flags suspicious behavior and then you have a conversation with the student right uh, one one other quick question: Is there a boilerplate statement that's that we can import into our quizzes, basically yeah. saying, you know, this is the the policy, this is the academic integrity policy, you know, and therefore you're signing that you are are uh, adhering to this code? Is does that exist, or do we have to just make it up no, as we? Can? No, that that exists. Um, I thought it was here under resources. You know, I'm still learning my way around this product as well, but um, there certainly is boilerplate information at some point. Let me go in here under settings, under monitor. Um, no. Um, Ah, here, under getting started, information for your syllabus and course description. If you expand that section, um, you can see some boilerplate that, uh, that they uh, have put, come up with, so you don't have to start anything, everything from scratch. Obviously, you can copy uh, this into you know, Word or someplace where you can edit it to, uh, to sound the way you want to, and then you know, add this as an addendum to your syllabus, since we're all way past the beginning of the semester handing out syllabi to students, or post this as a page in Moodle, saying we're gonna be doing this, I want you to read these directions, or put it up in Moodle as a, um, a feedback activity, and require them to sign off on the feedback. Uh, and you could even have them signing off on the feedback be the, um the trigger that indicates that they have completed that activity and you can make the moodle quiz opening contingent upon them having completed that feedback if anyone's that's what it, that's exactly what i'm after right i want so, somewhere I, they have to you yeah. know it's basically like when you you update your 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 apple software or whatever and it says you know you can't go any further unless you agree to this yeah. type of thing so what you would do is set up the feedback activity turn on completion tracking for that and specify how you want completion to be um, tallied up by automatically by Moodle. And then when you're creating your quiz settings under the, um, the, the part where, well here, let's just, let's just look at it. So let me go back to my sandbox here. So if we go to look at the settings for the quiz, Down at the bottom here, there is restrict access. You would have first set up the completion criterion for that feedback activity. You gotta read this, and you gotta check off this, and that will you know, make that activity complete. Then you would add the restriction based on, um, well, I don't, have any, I don't have any activities that have completion set up. There would be a category here that would be you know, activity completion, you would select that uh, activity have been completed before, you know, the student would have to complete that activity before they could even open the quiz. Mm -hmm. 
Excellent. Thanks. Great. So, uh, so that's a lot, I think. Um, we, I don't have, um, you know, I haven't given a quiz to a, a group of 25 students uh, to be able to have uh, the kind of results to show you back from a uh, lockdown browser and especially from monitor. I mean, if you do decide to use the respondents monitor, uh, definitely have students do a practice run at least a week ahead of, of any really high stakes exam you're going to be doing. Yeah. So uh, is the monitor um, uh, viewable by the proctor or is it just something that just gets archived so and flagged? You get, uh, if we go back to here, if I go back to my dashboard, And um, so um, once this final exam has taken place, uh, I can see various class results. Oh, so you're monitoring post, post quiz or post right. exam. Yeah, you're, you are not. You monitor in real time. No. Right, OK. So because I've got lockdown browser and monitor turned on here, I would be able to go here in here later. And any of any students who's had something show up on monitor that seems suspicious to their AI algorithms would be flagged as priority reviews here. And you could expand that out. I mean, there's nothing to expand out here because students haven't uh, gone through the process yet. But you would see, uh, if you expanded this student out, you would see their picture if you uh, selected that as part of the startup process. You would see the picture of their photo ID if you selected that as part of their startup process. And then you would see random, you would see a timeline of the time that they uh, were in the exam. Any time periods where there was suspicious activity going on would be flagged in the timeline. And then in, in addition, there would be just a set of random timed thumbnails from that uh, timeline uh, displayed as a gallery. So you could you know, just glance over and within a couple of seconds get an overall view of what was going on when the student was doing that, um, uh, doing that exam. And um, you know the specific, suspicious uh, events would be flagged on the timeline. You could click on that section of the timeline to review in more detail what was going on. And you know it could be oh the, the student's face was in the camera. Well, they just kind of bent down to I don't know Liz is having them work on some scratch paper, so they bent down to to make some notes on the scratch paper. And so, okay, fine. Um, that was suspicious for the AI, but I'm not going to worry about it. You know, things like that. Um, so, um, lots of ways to handle high stakes assessment for our classes. One is maybe you don't even have a final exam at all. You do some so sort of other authentic assessment, some project based as assessment. Two, you've got the uh, final exam you, that you want to give. You don't want to have to learn how to do a Moodle quiz or all this respondus stuff. So you write six different variations on that exam and you distribute it out. You break up in your class into six and you distribute it out as an assignment. And uh, you know you give them you have an, a Moodle assignment that opens up at uh, the time when your exam starts and closes with a hard cutoff at the time when your exam uh, ends. And during that time, they've got to take that Word document and write up the exam and submit it up as a Moodle assignment. Or you do it in Turnitin. Or you do the Moodle quiz 
you know, reformat your exam for the using the Moodle quiz functions. But maybe you just say, uh, I'm going to randomize the order of questions. I'm going to randomize the answers within the multiple choice questions. I'm going to have essay questions where I'm asking them to analyze and work with data. So it's not something they can just quickly look up on the internet. They've got this amount of time. You're just going to give them the straight Moodle quiz and, and that's going to be secure enough for me. Or you can wrap around lockdown browser and or monitor. Um, so I, I think we all have a lot of um, options for how to handle um, the issue of how we're going to do evaluation and assessment of our students at the, uh, uh, at the end of the semester. Uh, but I just want you all to have a whole variety of tools available to you uh, for figuring that out. I want to thank you very much. I appreciate all you've been doing to um, try to make this as as uh, useful and um, as close to the real class experience as possible. It's it's really, really, really uh, appreciated. Thank you. It's been a week. Let's put it that way. I know. <laughs> But yeah, um, I, you know, I'm, I've been also just been trying to lower the temperature for all of us. I mean, it's a very stressful situation for us. It's a very stressful situation for our students. And so uh, the more flexible we can be, the more the support we can, Marie and I can provide you, uh, we'll all get through this. And uh, yeah, yeah, thank you very much. I'm joining Elliot with this, thanks. Okay, uh, so thanks all for joining. I've got a SUNY call that's starting in a couple minutes. So uh, I did record this. I will stop the recording now.